Well, that's really great. We got, uh, we kind of had a lot of really deep, really weighty topics, so hopefully this is going to let you take a little bit of a breather. We're going to relax and talk about something easy and simple. But what I want to get across as a message is that something even as simple as board games can have some unforeseen consequences, can have some outcomes that can be positive in our lives and can have, have good results. So we're going to talk about board games, and this field has gone through a lot of, of different stages. We have, of course, in the history, the, the early board games. You have Monopoly and Risk and Sorry and all the Parker Brothers, Milton Bradley classics. And we have people who fondly remember their family game nights with those games. And that's, that's a wonderful time, and it's good to remember those fondly. And then there was a, a rebirth of board games, started in the 1980s, went through the 1990s. And these board games came about for some of the, the social classes that maybe were considered a little bit more outcast. The geeks, the nerds, who would often get together as a respite from uh, the lives that they lived, and they would play these games together. And there was, there was a, a, a huge new avenue for them to, uh, to play together and enjoy themselves without being ridiculed. And so, so we had this, this kind of rebirth. And since then, what's happened is those people have grown up. They've, they're now adults. They're 20-somethings, 30-somethings, 40-somethings who fondly remember those days. And they've taken it with them. And as they have we've seen a kind of a second rebirth, a new revolution, where things like comic books, things like superheroes, have become popular again. We have movies like Iron Man and The Avengers and Spider-Man. We have popular TV shows like The Big Bang Theory. And all these things are coming from what the now adult generation is remembering fondly of their childhood, and except now they are the drivers of the economy. And so, so they're re-experiencing these things once again, a lot of them with their children, enjoying themselves, and it's become, it's become big business. It's become something that everybody gets in on. And so this, this new geek chic is, is powering a new sort of positive feedback cycle. As it becomes more popular, it's now no longer in, it's now no longer something just that the geeks and the nerds and the outcasts experience, but we have more people who are just regular and everyday who, who hadn't had these experiences are now joining together. And when that happens, we get, we get new media, new board games, new TV shows and movies and all these kinds of things that broaden in their appeal. They get, they get new topics, they get new genres, and that leads to more diversity. And this positive feedback cycle keeps going and going, and the same thing has happened with board games. So board games today have become even bigger thanks to all of the different people who are enjoying playing them. All sorts of people with different backgrounds, and all sorts of different ages and different generations coming together. And so we get not just your typical tabletop game, your games like Sorry or Risk, we get new types of games with new mechanics that help to, to squeeze out the juices of what it means to interact socially with one another. And two of my favorites uh, that I want to talk about specifically is Deception games and cooperative games. Now, traditionally, we've only, we, we had the, the normal, everyday competitive game where you have you know, some number of players, maybe about four or six players, and you would play until somebody wins. But now we have new topics and new, new mechanics that help to drive games that people enjoy. Excuse me, that people enjoy even if they don't like to play competitive games. So we have games where you cooperate, games where you play together towards some common goal, and everybody works side by side. They bring their ideas 
on how to accomplish some sort of goal. There's games where you can play and be research scientists looking to travel the world and cure a, a mysterious plague. And you'll do, you'll do research and you'll help heal people. And everybody kind of wins or loses together. And losing's okay too, but you like to win. And then we have other games. These are games of deception where everybody plays and they don't know who else at the table is their friend or their enemy. And you sit there and you take on a new persona and you, you might undermine somebody else or you might truthfully be working for the same goal and not even know it. And those games are always a lot of fun because afterwards, when everything is all revealed, everybody then sits around and wants to talk about what happened. They want to say, oh, I had no idea all along that you were the betrayer. And so, so it's a really enjoyable experience, even for those people who typically don't enjoy direct competitive games where they're just out to be the one sole winner. Okay, so we have all these new mechanics, all these new genres that are bringing more people together and making a, a bigger board game community. And it's doing some other interesting things too. It's taking all those people and they're getting together, but they're doing it without technology. Ironically, Board games coming from an era of people who, who were typically considered geeks and nerds whose, whose role models might be people like Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or Elon Musk. But yet, when they sit down at a table, there are no computers, there are no cell phones. Matter of fact, it's frowned upon to take out your cell phone when the whole goal of the game is that you need to be interacting one-on-one. -on -one. You need to be looking people in the eye. You need to be focused and attentive on what's going on. And so it's a little bit of a faux pas. And technology kind of doesn't exist in that space. It allows you to escape. And so we have this wonderful get-together of everybody and what starts happening is we have different people from different walks of life. And the most prominent one are different age groups. There's fathers who bring their daughters. There's grandfathers who bring their grandsons. And unlike family game night where everybody sits around the table whether they want to or not and plays together, it's fun, but let's be honest, there are those people who, who are just there because they have to be. But here's, here's a place where everybody is there because they want to be, and you have two people who otherwise wouldn't know each other, one who's 50 or 60, 70 years old, and one who's seven, 10, 12, sitting at a table on a completely equal footing. They're all playing by the same rules. That 10-year-old has to play the exact same game that the 70-year-old does. She's got to stand her own, and everybody works together, or everybody plays the same game, and it's kind of a beautiful thing that happens. These are people who don't necessarily know one another, and yet they're interacting socially in a way that just doesn't happen anywhere else. We have young children who Think of how often do they really interact with other adults. Besides their teachers who are telling them what to do all day long, and besides their parents who are telling them what to do all day long, they don't necessarily get a lot of direct interaction where their opinion, their thoughts matter just as much as the adult next to them. But board games are providing that, and it's, it becomes a really becomes a really amazing force 
to, to help them grow and to help everybody have a quality social interaction. And so I, I want to share a couple personal anecdotes about, about just how strong that emotional bond can be and just how surprising it is. I was one day sitting down to play a game with a friend of mine, and he brings his son, his 10-year-old son in, and the boy comes up to me and he says, Hi, it's nice to meet you. My dad has told me so much about you. And I looked at him, and then I ignored him and I turned around. I didn't even understand what he was saying. It was, it was so unusual. And at the time, I didn't realize just how mature for his age that really was. But I did understand that, that it was something I had never seen before. And I just didn't know how to respond. In fact, he showed me that day that he was more socially mature than I was. Ask yourself how many 10-year-olds you know like that. And we sit down and we play games, and thankfully I got to know him very, very well. But we would play games, and his thoughts, his opinions, his ideas, his insights, it turned out were not just in playing the game, but were part of him as a human being that I otherwise never would have known existed. I know a, an older man, a grandfather, who brings his grandson, six years old, to play board games. And a six-year-old is barely able to sit in their seat for 10 or 15 minutes at a time, let's be honest. But here, they learn they learn to sit, they learn to focus, they learn to listen, they learn to win, and they learn to lose. And especially for a six-year-old, but true for all of us is sometimes it's hard to lose. And when you see a little boy or a little girl who looks at it and says, well, you know, I'm going to try better next game. Those are just the breaks. That's, that's a, a shocking experience, and a really positive one. So I've had this amazing experience of sitting down at a table with a group of fellow human beings of all ages, of all walks of life, no technology needed, and learned how to have a real social experience. And so I challenge you all to do the same. Thanks.